is from Isaiah chapter 52. I'll be reading the first 12 verses. And these are the words of God. Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion, put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for the uncircumcised and the unclean shall no longer come to you. Shake yourself from the dust, arise, sit down, O Jerusalem, loose yourself from the bonds of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, you have sold yourselves for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, my people went down at first into Egypt to dwell there. Then the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now, therefore, what I have, what have I here, says the Lord, that my people are taken away for nothing. Those who rule over them, make them wail, says the Lord. And my name is blasphemed continually every day. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he who speaks. Behold, it is I. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Your watchmen shall lift up their voices. With their voices they shall sing together, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord brings back Zion. Break forth into joy. Sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing, go out from the midst of her. Be clean, you who bear the vessels of the Lord, for you shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Thus the reading of God's word, let us ask his blessing now upon it. Father in heaven. Your word is before us, and the new year as well. If anything, we should understand our deeper need to understand the world around us and our circumstances we find ourselves in only in light of your word. And so grant us discernment and soft hearts by your Holy Spirit that we would see and live and delight in obeying and trusting you and all to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> there is the old saying, we do not know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. Something to hang with, I think, in this coming year. I don't think any of us had what happened in 2020 in our sight a year ago. How many of you spent this last week trying to remember where you were, what was going on on New Year's Eve 2019, and thinking, wow, how did we get here now? It's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy to think of all that has gone on. But there does not seem to be any sense of, whew, well, glad that's over, huh? We kind of thought it would be. We kind of looked towards the end of the year. We, we looked towards the end of the summer. I remember looking towards the end, towards Easter, thinking we're going to get through this and through that. And, and then cities erupted. And then election things happened. And then it's... And, and then all of the things that I know have gone on in personal lives. It has been quite a year. It has been quite a year. And it doesn't look like things are slowing down, frankly. Someone, once, someone said to me that, um, uh, you know, we, we used to talk about that one day we would look back on 2020. And then they said, no, actually, I think one day we'll look back on the 20s. I think this is going to go on a little bit longer than we all expected, all that is before us. We are in the midst right now of political, social, and cultural upheaval. That is what is going on all around us. An all-out attack on religion, an all-out attack on our civil uh, traditions is going on. Panic and fear and strife abound and are being um, frothed up more and more all around us. Are we, seeing, are we seeing our culture deteriorate and are we watching it move at a much faster pace than ever before in our lives? Before this decay was so advanced, there were many of us who were doubters who would say, oh, it's, it's not that bad. Now the temptation, I believe, will be to believe that there's no turning back, that nothing can be done, that it's all over. It's all over for us. But we must remember that we worship a God who speaks and life comes out of nowhere, except by the power of his word. In creation, God spoke, and out of nothing, everything that was 
created was created by the power of his word and nothing else. There was nothing. And then, by his word, everything came into being. What has God done with closed wombs, with dark tombs, with hard hearts, and rebellious nations? We have sung several psalms this morning reflecting on some of those thoughts already about how God moves by the power of his word and shakes everything up, about how God sovereignly releases, grants freedom, establishes nations, and then in the midst of their rebellion, he brings um, his own discipline and chastisement upon them. He takes them into exile. He brings them out then of exile. And of course, we know the stories of death and resurrection and of course, the great story of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And so I want to take a look at this passage. If you have your Bibles, I want you to notice these uh, verses because I'd like you to see what Isaiah was saying and then how hundreds of years later, Paul would be able to take from this and apply it in his situation, in the, new, in the days of the new covenant, in the establishment of the church. And then from that, learn how we are to see what God is saying to us and how we should live in the midst of our day. Zion, Zion is told to awake. Wake up, Zion, wake up. Zion is the covenant people of God. Zion is, is a kind of pet name for the covenant people of God that Isaiah, the Lord, is addressing. And, there, and he's called, or she's called to awaken because they are in a stupor and slumber. They're not responding to God. They're not responding to his ways. And they're called to put on their strength, for they are unnecessarily weak. And beauty, for they have become common and ugly. They don't stand out as precious and beautiful and adorned with the Lord's riches and beauty. Well, this is our situation. We are that Zion today. The church in our midst is that Zion today that needs to wake up from a stupor and a slumber, that needs to put on strength because for some reason, although there are tens of millions of Christians in America, we have no strength. We have no strength to stand and speak to this culture. We have no strength to stand and change and lead this culture. And we become common. We don't look different. In fact, we have much of the ugliness of the world around us. This state that Zion is in means that nations have no interest in her, it says in verse 1. No interest at all. And, and then, but the Lord calls her to shake it off. Shake this off and stand up. Shake this off and sit down in the glory that is yours, O Jerusalem. Loose yourselves from the bonds of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. You don't have to be in this state, he says. The Lord says that Zion has sold all of this special place that she had for nothing. Gave it up for a pot of stew. Gave it up for nothing. But in the very same verse, in verse 3, there's the promise that she'll be redeemed. and She'll be redeemed without money, which is a good thing because she is broke. We can't dig ourselves out of the of situation that we are in. We can't buy or pay ourselves out of the situation that we find ourselves in. What God is going to do is just what he did for her in Egypt and in her struggle with Assyria in verses 4 and 5. And it will be simply because he speaks. Verse 6. That inspired speaking through his prophets is good news then. And so we see in verse 7 this, this great and um, and, and well-known um, verse that says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. This declaration of when God comes to speak and the one who brings that message is beautiful and strong and glorious. This word changes everything. And so when it's proclaimed from the mountaintops, declaring God's sovereign reign, then the watchmen... Those that are hearing this good news break out in singing together as Zion is returned to her rightful place in verse 8. And then look closely at verse 9. And notice closely, I want you to see how what, what, is, what is declared is something that's in the future for Isaiah as he's speaking, but something that is so sure that he declares it as though it is in the present. Verse 9, break forth and into joy, sing together, you, you waste places of Jerusalem. In other words, to the very, to the, to the least and to the to broken and to the empty and to the, um, the, the church or the covenant people that have nothing. Break forth into singing. Why? For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. And here's the promise. All the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. In other words, what God is saying to a broken 
not just a broken nation, but to a broken people, to his broken church, is the promise is this. Wake up, get up, be filled, break into joy. Why? Because I intend to use you to, to make sure that all of the world knows, all of the world knows about me. All of the wor world knows that the Lord God reigns. Redemption is coming to the world. So, the, the waste places in the present are to break forth in singing because this word comforts surrounding the future so sure that it can be declared as though it were in the present. In fact, not only Zion, but all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God. So more than a restoration, more than just being brought out of exile, there is a promise of a greater redemption coming in verse 10. And so again, the prophet cries out, this time not awake and awake, but depart. Walk away from what you've been holding on to. Walk away to your, from your slumber, from your stupor, from your weakness. Walk away from being common. Because when you see the vision and when God grants faith, repentance comes as well. And there's freedom to leave our sin and walk away from its powerful clutches. Whether you're speaking to an individual about, his, um, uh, about the sin that has so wrapped him up, so in, um, put him in chains... Or whether you're speaking to a church, that it, uh, the church that has got itself so wrapped up in worldliness, either way, wake up and depart. The strength of the power of the word of God is enough to change anyone and anything and any situation and any generation. And this is because we do not have to do it on our own. Rather, the Lord goes before us, leading the way while protecting us from behind. Look at verse 12. For you shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be, be your rear guard. What, what, Isaiah, what Isaiah's picture, what he wants you to see is, I'm going to bring you out, the Lord says. I'm not calling you to just, to, to just do it on your own. I'm bringing you out, and I will lead you, and I'll stand before it, behind you. I will lead you and show you the way to go, and I'll protect you from behind as well. That's a promise that Isaiah is given to a bro giving to a broken, sleepy, um, worldly, full of sin Israel, Zion. Now, Paul picks up this idea in Romans chapter 10. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 10. Here we learn not only um, what was going on in uh, as this is being fulfilled in Jesus and in the new church. But we also see and learn from um, Paul again how the New Testament is to be our interpretation of the Old Testament and the fulfillment for us of Jesus in the new covenant and our own application of it now hundreds and hundreds of years later. I'm going to pick up in Romans chapter 10 and read, first of all, chapter 10, verses 13 through 15. For whoever s calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved quoting another passage. And then he begins talking about that. Verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. There it is in verse seven, Paul quoting back from Isaiah 52 in his discourse, and, and this is in chapters 10 and 11, which is speaking upon, about the judgment upon unbelieving Israel again. We've got unbelieving Israel, the Jews in that day who are persecuting the church, who are persecuting the Christians. And God's promise through Paul that, that God is going to crush and bring down in a final judgment upon, upon Jerusalem, upon Israel for their unbelief. And that through that, in the midst of that, the gospel is going to go forth to the Gentiles and to all the world. And that's, that's, what, the, that's what chapters 10 and 11 are all about. So God's purpose is in, in, in bringing judgment upon Israel is that at the same time, the, the, the gospel is going to go out to all the Gentile nations and then Israel as well, end of chapter 11, to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. So 1015 is... is, is uh, um, is quoting Isaiah about that. And, and if you look ahead just to chapter 11, for, for instance, in verse 25, <clears throat> he says in this argument, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. God was at work in the midst of, rebellious, of a rebellious people that were being judged, 
bringing out a new group, a new, a new faithful remnant that would become the ministers of the Gospels, the angels that would go and gather the elect all over the world. That's the new covenant church of whom we are a part, which is worth thinking about. If you look back in, in chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, uh, we are told in verses 9 and 10 that anyone who confesses Jesus as Lord will be saved. And again in verse 13, that whoever calls upon the Lord will be saved. And in those quotations from the Old Testament, the, the, the Old Testament Hebrew is Yahweh. In other words, anyone who calls on Yahweh, anyone who calls on Jesus, on the name of Jesus, is going to be saved. Verses 9 and 10 again. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Then look at verse 13. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, quoting the Old Testament, shall be saved. Jesus is God. And anyone who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, believes that he is God, that he came from heaven, that he, that he died on the cross for your sins, paying for, paying for all of, of your wickedness, all of your evil, and forgiving you, and granting you new life, anyone who believes on that in any situation will be saved. And any generation who turns will be saved. Any, new ch any church in any kind of situation they find themselves who turn to the Lord Jesus in this way will be saved. And God will use him. God will use him to bring the, the nations to the Lord. They, they won't, but then he goes and says these, these words in, in the next verses, in, um, in verses 16 and 17. They won't call on him if they don't believe. Someone's going to have to um, bring faith. And they won't believe if they've not heard the voice of Jesus. In other words, if that preaching, if the word hasn't been the, the very word of Jesus by the spirit that, that grabs hold of hearts and changes them. Men can't change hearts. But the preaching of the word, when it is Jesus by his spirit that goes in, pierces, convicts consciences, turns people from darkness to light, brings them into a life they could never walk into outside of the preached word empowered by God's spirit in such a way that someone hears the voice of Jesus speaking to them in the midst of that. Well, they won't believe if they've not heard the voice of Jesus. And he goes on and says, and they cannot hear that voice if they haven't heard a preacher. And a preacher can't preach, he says, unless he's been sent. And, what, what, and the point there is not just uh, a call for missionaries to go out and preach because out there in the, in the, in the wilderness, they're not hearing or in, in some continent somewhere else. While that's true, the context here, what Paul is saying is, is that unless the preacher's been sent by God, it doesn't matter what he says. It must be the work of God through the preacher that brings forth belief, faith, repentance, and then transformation. In other words, God has to do it. But, but, what has God promised to send? Verse 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Men who preach in just such a day as this, God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns now. So here we are, where church and world need to hear and need to believe that our God reigns. So where are the preachers? Where are the preachers? Why hasn't God sent them? Why are we not hearing the proclamation of the lordship of Jesus Christ over all nations? Why are we not hearing the proclamation to the kings of this earth to bow the knee before the Lord Jesus Christ? Why are we not hearing that, that, that there's only one way of salvation and it is through the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection? Why is that not being openly proclaimed in the world around us and even into churches all around us? It seems that God has sent a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, but of hearing the words of the Lord, as he promised in Amos 8. Well, here's the answer. Why, why are we not sending preachers? Or why hasn't God sent them? Why are we not hearing preachers? We are not hearing the word. And here it is. We are not hearing the word because we do not want to hear the word. We are offended by the word. We find the word to be intolerant. 
We think the word is mean and divisive. We don't want to hear that God created the world in six days a few thousand years ago. That offends our scientific senses. We do not want to hear that Adam was created from the dirt. We do not want to hear that God created man in his image, male and female, and that's it. No mistake, not, not an error, completely by his design. We don't want to hear that marriage is therefore between one man and one woman, and that's it. We don't want to hear that life begins at conception and that we have murdered tens of millions of people in our country with our own hands. We don't want to hear that our politicians are corrupt because our pulpits in our country, I'm um, sorry, because our pulpits and our personal lives are corrupt. In other words, we don't want to hear how well represented we are. We don't want to hear that there's only one way of salvation. We don't want to hear, we don't even want to hear that we need salvation. We don't want to hear that we are sinners lost all the way down to our hearts and souls. We don't want to hear that. We want to be friends with the world. We want to be soft, kind, egalitarians. We want the government to take care of us and our problems and especially to keep us safe at all costs. We want less risk. We want more comfort. We want a vaccine for COVID, but we don't want anyone telling us that pandemics come from the Lord. We don't want anyone coming up and quoting Ezekiel 28, for I will send pestilence upon her and blood in her streets. Or Amos 3, 6, if a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people be afraid? If there is calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? We don't want to hear that God has sovereignly brought this all upon us. We don't want to hear that he even has brought the fear and the panic. We don't want someone quoting Deuteronomy 28. Your life shall hang in doubt before you. You shall fear day and night and have no assurance of life. In the morning you shall say, oh, that it were evening. And at evening you shall say, oh, that it were morning. Because of the fear which terrifies your heart and because of the sight which your eyes see. These are life verses for many people going into 2021. We don't want our pulpits to speak to the civil government, but we do want our pulpits to submit to them unconditionally. We have sold ourselves for nothing. That's what Isaiah said. We've sold ourselves for nothing. We've walked away from our strength. We've walked away from our glory and our beauty. We've walked away from being the kind of people who stand out as different because of our obedience, because of our trust, because of our rejoicing, because of our unfaltering, unswerving dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord of my life, of Lord of all of my life, of Lord of our lives. We have no preachers because we shout them down. We have no preachers because God has given us over to our lusts. And so we're in a stupor. We are weak. And we're unattractive. How beautiful are feet of him who brings good news. What has God promised? Is it over? The psalmist in Psalm 119, you know, this is the longest psalm, 176 verses. Every single one of those verses is reflecting on some aspect of the word, often with a lot of repetition. In Psalm 119, verse 126, it says, It is a time for you to act, O Lord. Now's the time. It is time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void. The world around us believes that the word of God is useless, is not authoritative. The world around us believes that the word of God is archaic and wrong. And the reason the world believes those things is because the church for generations has been teaching that. That the word is mostly irrelevant. Why do you bother studying the Old Testament, for goodness sakes? It doesn't make any sense to you, does it? Why should you study it? 
You have enough time just trying to understand some of the new. It's not relevant to my life. It's not helpful. In fact, it's wrong. It's wrong. Science has proven it's wrong. And don't tell me about God's sovereignty over the work of all things going on in this, in this world. That's not what's going on. These are based on decisions we've made. God is outside of this picture. He's, he's not, he, he may be actively occasionally jumping in and doing something, but he's not the one sovereignly bringing all this apart because our God is a God of love. He would never, we say, fill in the blank. It's time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void. Claims the church, the remnant, the ones who believe that God is still on the throne. Charles Spurgeon wrote these words, The saints sigh for the presence and power of their God. Oh, for an hour of the king upon the throne and the rod of iron. Oh, for another Pentecost with all its wonders. When the earth was without form and void, the spirit came and moved upon the face of the waters. Should he not come when society is returning to a like chaos? How heartily may we pray the Lord to raise up new evangelists, to set his whole church on fire, and to bring the world to his feet. Turning to our text and the interpretation of it in Romans, we have no preachers because God is not sending them. And so Psalm 119, 126 is appropriate. Our prayer, it is time to act, O Lord. It is time now to act, O Lord. For you have regarded they have regarded your law as void. But what has he promised? What has he promised and how should we live in the midst of such a prayer? It's time to see with eyes of faith that which cannot be seen. Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And here is what we are to do that Isaiah teaches us. We are to look at a world and not see any way out and know that God has a plan. We're to look out and see a world crumbling, a society crumbling around us and believe God is up to something. God is up to something good, powerful, and beautiful. This is the year to believe the gospel. This is the year to believe the good news that our God reigns like you have never believed before. It is the time to proclaim the future with such certainty that you sound as though it has already arrived and to do so at whatever the cost of your reputation. Break forth into joy, sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem. There is your life verse. For 2021. Break forth into joy and sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem. Because God is at work. I take this idea to end here with from a passage in, in Doug Wilson's book, Mother Kirk, where he asks this question that I think is very, very helpful to think about. Who would you rather be? The contemporary man who, after scanning the news on the internet, flashing through channel after channel of bad news, or on the flat screen TV, gets up to freshen his drink at the fridge, comments to his wife how horrible the condition of the world is as he sits back down in his nice, comfortable chair with air conditioning or heating and lighting and running water and job and family. Or the Puritan, tied to the stake, to be burned because he will not compromise, who rejoices at that stake that Christ rules and reigns from heaven over this earth and that he will be worshiped from the river to the ends of the earth. One sits in ease and is overwhelmed with troubles. Don't be that guy. One sits in ease and is overwhelmed with troubles. The other is surrounded by troubles and yet speaks the word that goes forth conquering and to conquer. The first has won his life in what he thinks is a losing battle. And the second is losing his life in what he knows to be a winning battle. Do you know who holds the future? And do you know him? Do you know him? Will you sing like it?
Will we sing like it this year? And will we live like it? Will we live according to it? Will we live according to a faith in things because we hope in things we cannot see? Or will we fall to the despair that, that the world's encouraging us to fall to? No. Our God reigns. So welcome to 2021. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are truly in a mess. And we need the firepower of your Holy Spirit to awaken the church. To bring us reformation and revival. To drive us to repentance. Right here in my own heart first. To repentance and faith. Lord, to raise up men who will thunder your word and to see the work of the gospel save this sorry world. Protect, embolden, equip your people. Lead them from, from before them, protect them from behind. Equip your people for all that is needed in this coming year and beyond. To the glory of your name, in Jesus' name, amen. Page 369, let's stand together and sing, O God of Earth and Altar. <laughs>